15 Hello, minutes. everybody. And this turn is rough. As one of the members of the Freedom Caucus, I'd like to thank you for attending today. We're setting a different direction for New Hampshire in that what has tradi traditionally happened behind closed doors is kind of out in the open, in that the candidates can share their views, their vision for New Hampshire, and through media, through video, all the citizens will get a chance to weigh in on this. Um, I would like to thank um, our corporate sponsor who's helping this, Americans for, for Prosperity, along with um, Strata Policy Research. They are releasing a peer study examining New Hampshire's high electric rates um, and why the state has the fifth highest electric rate nationally and the third highest rate in the continental US, United States. Um, and we'll be offering a white paper um, on November 13th um, coming up. It's a free luncheon. It's at the Radisson in Manchester. If you're interested in attending, there is a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, that is one of the areas that we need to change. Our businesses and our families are, are getting crushed with these electric rates. With that, um, I will introduce our panelists. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware of who the candidates are. Our panelists are Drew Klein. Okay, Drew Klein is currently president or CEO of the Bartlett Center or whatever. Josiah Bartlett Center. We've got um, Andrew, sorry. Um, Andy Cruz. Andy Cruz, thank you. President of Auto Fair. Michelle Lavelle, who's the founder of School Choice in Hampshire. And Ed Neal, who's the chairman of the Coalition of Hampshire Taxpayers. Um, for logistics, the bathrooms are out this door. For those who have not been here, if there's any questions, water is on its way. Thank you much. Thank you, JR. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Len Turcotte. I'm a representative uh, for the town of Barrington, which is the Stratford, Stratford District 4. I'm uh, just going to go, go over a few uh, items so you all understand how these, this forum came about and how, how it's going to operate. Every forum participant, including the uh, questioners, have received copies of the format and the rules in advance. All the panelist questions that you will hear were developed by the panelists themselves, and uh, none of us um, have seen them, and we, the first time we hear them will be the first time you all hear them. The exception will be, um, uh, we may, if time permitting, have some lightning round questions towards the end. Uh, those were submitted in advance, or some were submitted in advance. The order of both the opening remarks, the closing remarks, and where the candidates chose to sit themselves uh, was done by a drawing just a few minutes ago. And so once we start the opening remarks, um, you'll see the order of that. Um, the order of the candidates' responses to each question was set up by myself in advance with a rather lengthy uh, spreadsheet to ensure that every candidate gets a spot in a uh, different order throughout the um, throughout the forum. The panelists will be um, asking their questions in alphabetical order each time. The timing of each candidate's response will be kept by Representative Dan Itza in the front row. Um, at 15 seconds, uh, for the candidates, since this is important for you, at 15 seconds he will hold up a yellow card with 15 seconds remaining. And uh, at your time expiration, he will hold up a red card. I am going to, in order to keep this form on track. I am going to be very strict with the, the card, so take the yellow card as a uh, good warning. <coughs> Lastly, um, well, as a reminder, I will say that this is a form. This is not going to be a debate. Um, we've asked each candidate in, their, in the, uh, the rules and that we sent out to them to uh, address their, question, uh, their responses to the, um, the audience, myself, or to the panelists and not to other individuals on the podium. Last, we're going to ask that all the audience members here, please, please keep your applause, jeers, uh, heckling, whatever you wish, would like to do, please keep that to the end. It'll keep our forum running just a little bit smoother and a little bit quicker. So with that, uh, Mr. Moderator, yes, sir. I apologize that I'm going to interrupt. 
Mr. Moderator, I am offended that the minority leader is at a Republican debate. The Republican Party hey, deserves better than this. Mr. Moderator, I'm not going to be shut down. We stand, Republicans stand on principles, honor, and integrity. Those principles, honor, and integrity will not allow me to be in this debate. We have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor with the executive counselor, and this is not how I am going to run the House when I am elected speaker. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Representative Burke. That'll make the forum go just a little bit quicker. All right, so uh, Representative Burke did have the opening remarks. I guess we'll call that Mr. Uh, John's opening remarks, and we will go to uh, number two, which is Representative McConnell. I'll make sure this works before we get started. Okay. First of all, I'm very pleased to be here. I think most of you know me pretty well. I'm not exactly the shy retiring type. Uh, it's pretty clear where I stand on most significant issues because I choose to speak in the well quite frequently and I send emails out to everyone. There are two particular issues that I have chosen to focus on. One is the manner in which the Finance Committee operates, and I have pointed out some changes that I'd like to make in that. Uh, beyond the changes that I've pointed out, which I elaborated on this past spring, I thought about another one that I'm going to probably be offering, which will uh, require, uh, which will provide rather for discharge resolutions. So, in fact, we could take something away from the Finance Committee should it not choose to deal with it. Uh, that's something that I think is very important, first of all, because it empowers the House as a body at large, and second, because it ensures that one of the points that I was concerned about with respect to the Finance Committee is that they work with the policy committees. and pretty well requires that they do, because if they don't, the issue that they're trying to bottle up will come to the floor. In any event, I'm still working on that, but I expect that by the time we begin our session in January, I'll have that put to bed and ready to go. The uh, fact is that I'm a political junkie. I've been at this for better than 50 years. Um, I think most of you know my background, but in 1976 I was drafted to run for Congress against Ed Koch as a conservative candidate in the east side of Manhattan. I was Pat Buchanan's campaign manager when he needed one when he was running for president on the Reform Party ticket in Florida in 2000. In the summer of 2014 I was Bob Smith's field director. Uh, I've been a Ron Paul supporter up here, and obviously I like politics very much. If I am in fact selected to be the speaker, I'll do everything I can to make sure that everyone not just Republicans, are well represented, and we reflect the fact that everyone has constituents to represent. Thank you. Representative Shirtlift. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I was born and raised here in Concord, graduated from Bishop Brady, looked at my high school grades and my SAT scores and immediately enlisted in the U.S. Army. <laughs> Spending uh, three years in the Army, a year in Vietnam, and when I got out, I eventually was hired by the U.S. Department of Justice, U.S. Marshals, spent three years in Cleveland before coming back to New Hampshire with a whole new appreciation for the Granite State. Um, I retired in the year 2000 as a supervisor and was elected to the House in 2004 and to the Concord City Council in 2007. Um, I, I want to say I'm sorry that my friend, and he is my friend from Goffstown, left us. I see, look around this room and I see a lot of friends, and I mean friends, who are members of the Republican Party. and we operate too often in a silo, speaking to each other. As my dad used to say, I've learned much more from people I disagree with than those that I agree with. I'm not just here to talk to you folks, but I'm also here to hear what the other folks on this panel have to say. And, uh, and, and that's the only way we're going to get ahead. And when we get ahead, that means the people in New Hampshire are going to move forward. So thank you all. Thank you, Representative. Uh, next up, uh, Representative Lori Sanborn. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. We have a real opportunity to make a very positive impact on the lives of the people of New Hampshire. My name is Lori Sanborn, and I'm a fourth generation New Hampshire native. I've lived in the state my entire life, and I love the state, and I'm here to serve you. I've decided to run for speaker because I know that I have the skills, I have the experience, I have the ability, and I have the time to devote to this to make sure we have a well-running New Hampshire house. 
My background in terms of the legislature, I've, I'm in my fourth term. I've been assistant deputy majority leader. I have been Republican policy leader, vice chair of committees. I have led several different caucuses. Uh, but equally important, I've been a business owner and I've been an executive in a number of corporations. And I know how to run an organization, whether it's a for-profit entity or a group of volunteers like many of you here. I know how to run it efficiently and with lots of compassion. And that's what I will do. I will lead this house with a steady hand. We will not have disruption. I've already made a commitment that chairs, vice chairs, and committee clerks, if you want to stay where you are, that's wonderful. We appreciate all the great work that you have been doing. But what we do need to change is how we treat people. And we do need to change what we get accomplished. We need to do more. This election is more than just making sure the trains run on track on the, on the right time. Um, this is more about the future. This is about the 2018 election. How confident are we as Republicans that we're going to be in the majority in 2018 if we don't see change? I think it is time to change. The status quo is not enough. The voters want to see results. They want to see us not fighting and bickering amongst ourselves. They want to see us come together to solve problems. As your speaker, I will work with absolutely everyone to solve the problems of the people of New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Next up is Rep uh, Representative Steve Smith. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Freedom Caucus and AFP and everyone else that helped put this on. I'm from Sullivan County. Uh, I spent 16 years as a software tester, project manager, and trainer for a tech company. But before that, I worked in book binaries, Woolen Mills, uh, Steel Foundry. And every one of those places that I worked is now gone. And please don't start scribbling. Smith is a job killer. <laughs> it's just what happens. Um, I don't know what somebody in my situation that didn't have an advanced degree at that time would do. I didn't want to be a burden on the state. I wanted to go to work. And there are places to do that. There was a place in Newport, Arlington Sample, that used to have a help wanted sign on pressure treated lumber. It stood there 15 years. That's gone. One of the things we need to do is find ways to get manufacturing back so that people can go to work, they can feel good, and I don't feel that we're focusing on that enough. Um, we are sure doing things about it, but it's not what you hear. It's not the focus that we bring, um, that leadership has brought. What do you hear about? You hear the same labor fights, election law fights, and, and those are all important, and we have to have those fights, but it doesn't have to be what we lead with. I don't want young people to continue to leave the state, and I don't want people to not want to get involved in the legislature, because they're tired of the same old stuff. We've done some exciting things. We passed uh, autonomous vehicle technology bills. We've got new transportation technologies coming to the state. The governor has a new robotics scholarship. These are the things we need to be beating a drum on if we're gonna retain young people both in the state and attract them to get politically involved. Um, I, I go to way too many rooms where at 53, I'm the youngest guy in the room. That's got to change, and I think we change it by bringing people together and, and change the focus. As Speaker, I'll try to run the House efficiently, make sure that we're focusing on the words that are in the bill, not somebody's idea of what the bill is. That happens way too often. Um, we'll debate the concept. So focus the debate. Try to make it interesting so that a regular person who is not glued to Fox News or MSNBC 24-7 wants to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Next up is Rep uh, Representative Gene Chandler. Thank you. My name is Gene Chandler, and I'm running the speaker. I live in Bartlett, where I've lived my whole life so far, and I plan to spend the rest of it there, God willing. But, um, I've been in the House a long time. There are many that would say too long. I get that. But I think I bring, bring a lot of experience, uh, especially here in this, what I call a mid-year election, which is sort of unprecedented. And I think the, the number of days that we're going to have from the time of this election till the session starts are, are really very few. And I felt I would step up to the plate, offer my experience as one that could get us going in the session, um, been following some of the retained bills, understand where they are, where the committees are. So I think it would lead to a smoother transition. And there's nothing against any of the people on this panel. They were all very well qualified. But I, I think I have the experience to do the job. My, my main goal, other than some policy issues, which I'm sure we'll get into, but my main goal, goal is bringing the Republican caucus together. Excuse me, Steve, but I have that has to be my goal. And uh, I just, I think I have a proven track record over the years of being able to do that. I'm willing to listen to anybody at any time. I've already stated publicly that any of the groups, the various groups, and we have some in the party, will be able to have an on-site place to meet 
during the session. Um, I've said that publicly. I've said that I will appoint some members of that group um, to the, my leadership team in an effort to become more inclusive. Everyone needs to be heard. Are we going to agree on everything all the time? No. I wish we could. That should be our goal, but we're not. But if we don't talk and sit down and have the discussion, we're not going to agree on anything. So I think it's just really important that everybody be included, and I'm willing to do that. My past record shows that I can, and I pledge to continue that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, last the opening remarks, Representative Al Balsar. Hard price to pay to be one of the finest at the end, right? <laughs> but anyways, I'm Representative Al Balsar. I'm from London Derry. I'm on my 11th uh, year at the House. I'm a former chairman uh, of a committee, former vice chair. I am the former tribe chair of the House Republican Alliance. What I bring to the table here is experience, like my good friend Gene here. First of all, I want to clarify, thank uh, Len. Uh, it's not up for us to decide how you run your format, and I support what you did here as a team, because together, everyone achieves more, whether we like it or not. It is our job as a speaker to work with the Democrats. It's not our job to push them aside. Even though I'm a Republican, I understand the need to work hand in hand and bring everyone back together. I guarantee I'll bring the House Republican Alliance back. I bring everyone back together. And the reason why I say that, I'm part of leadership. I am part of, you know, with the Freedom, Friends with the Freedom Caucus. I was tri chair of the House Republican Alliance. Every veteran bill I put in the House has a Democrat on my bill, okay? Because I believe that veterans' issues are nonpartisan. I've worked on the elderly bill, on the elderly protection bill with Catherine Rogers, who will tell me she's the biggest progressive in the House. And we work hand in hand, we come together. I grew up a Democrat. My grandfather, four-term mayor. I grew up a Tip O'Neill, the Kennedys. I understand the politics. I was born a Democrat. And then I seen the light. I learned how to spend my I learned how to spend my own money, and I became a Republican. But my experiences as a brain, running five thousand man ten camps, operations, budgeting, all that. I was the vice president of sales, marketing, recruiting, human resources. After I get out, so I have the experience on managing. Okay, four hundred is just a small drop in the bucket. I right, thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Baldessaro. I'd like to uh, <coughs> say uh, the candidates are off to a great start. Every one of you held right to the uh, time limits. That's excellent. Once we get to the regular questions here now, these are only going to be one minute long. Um, and again, we're going to ask that you please do try to stick with the, the time limits. So the first question is going to be uh, given by uh, Mr. Klein. He's going to give the uh, question, and what we're going to, what I'm going to do is call out the order one by one of who speaks at what time. Mr. Klein. Thank you. I apologize in advance for the long preamble. I don't like to do preamble questions, but I think the context of this question is appropriate for the people in the audience, so I'll try to be quick. This big issue coming up next year. New Hampshire's actuarial consultant for DHHS recently released a study projecting that keeping the Medicaid expansion population in the Obamacare marketplace will cost $426 million more next year, $26 million in additional state funds, than serving that population in Medicaid managed care would. It projected that over the next three years, the state would pay an additional $48.5 million if the Medicaid expansion population stays in the Obamacare exchange. The Gorman Actuarial Report found that putting the Medicaid expansion population in the individual marketplace has already driven up insurance rates for those unsubs unsubsidized individuals in the marketplace. So my question to you is, two part, what do you think the state should do with the Medicaid expansion population during the next year? And what is your view on Medicaid expansion going forward after the current authorization lets out? First round, <clears throat> Representative Baldessaro, you are up. Okay, very simple. Uh, first of all, I'm not a big supporter of Medicaid expansion. <coughs> First of all, I'm not a big supporter of Medicaid expansion. I think Medicaid expansion needs to go. The state already had Medicaid. We've lost 22,000 people, lost their insurance here in New Hampshire because of Medicaid expansion. People are going broke with the deductibles. They're not even going to the doctors anymore because they got maybe 7,500 to 12, $15,000 deductibles. 
not counting the co-payments that are going on. My plan with the people is to push what the president passed on, on going cross-border, teaming up, putting companies where they can join together, okay, uh, in other countries, attract companies to come into New Hampshire, to be able to sell cheaper insurance there to the people. There are people having a choice on insurance. I'm fortunate, I have TRICARE, okay, uh, which is military retirement, but I use the VA, okay, and the reason is because it's cost effective for me. People have to make their own choices, and it's up to them to do that, and I believe we can do a better job with cheaper insurance. Representative Chandler. Thank you very much. I'll start off by saying that my answer is going to be a little waffly, and I apologize for that because I, I think the problem is we don't know yet what the federal government intends to do. Generally speaking, I'm opposed to Medicaid expansion. As minority leader, I opposed it on, in three different bills back in 2014 and had over 90% of Republicans join with that effort to oppose it. But I think we need to see. I just recently, you spoke about the insurance department. Just before I came over here, I spoke with Representative Hunt who's somewhat knowledgeable on these issues, and he said, well, the insurance commissioner had just called him and now wants to talk to him because he's not sure about what these rates are gonna be. So I think it's just so fluid now, it's very hard until we see a bill to really say much. I have this information from Maine, just came out, and I've asked the insurance commissioner to comment on it, that the 2018 premiums for over 40,000 Mainers will be zero if they sign up for the bronze plan. So that's a whole new thing. So I think there's so much going on that we need to watch it. Generally speaking, I have opposed it in the past, and that's, I'm done. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Next up, try Representative McConnell. I have opposed and will continue to oppose Medicaid expansion. I think it has not been the net positive that many people in the state want to say that it has. Uh, Quite frankly, I've not heard from any of my constituents who said that they have benefited from it, have benefited from it, and quite a number who have indicated that they have suffered as a result. Uh, I'm not persuaded that this was well thought out in the first place, and I think Nancy Pelosi was right on the money when she said we have to pass it to find out what's in it. We did. It stinks. It's a bad idea. I want out. And were I the speaker last year when that decision came down, we had a tie vote, it would have failed. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Sanborn. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that we should let Medicaid expansion under Obamacare expire, as it's expected to do so at the end of 2018. We've predicted all along that the cost would be way higher than anyone predicted. We predicted that this was going to raise health insurance rates for everyone, and it did. So now is the time that we must start passing free market health insurance reforms. Uh, Representative Baldessero mentioned a few of them. We need to allow insurance companies to cross state lines so that you have more insurance choices. We need to get away from the minimum essential benefits package so that you could buy a catastrophic plan or buy other different types of plans to lower your costs. We need to lower health insurance costs for everyone. Now the question about this population, they, you know, they, they know it's going to end. We knew this was coming, but then we have to look at why are these able-bodied, working-age people not able to get jobs? We have a very robust economy. If they need job training, if there's something else that we should be doing, we need to take a look at that. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Shirtland. Thank you, and thank you, Drew, for your question. I guess it would be no surprise to say I'm a strong supporter of Medicaid expansion, and I'll tell you why. We have 55,000 people benefiting from Medicaid expansion in New Hampshire right now. 100,000 have gone through that program. A lot of those people have been able to have their teeth fixed and other medical treatment that has kept them back in the workplace. Uh, as far as Medicaid expansion, we know that right now the biggest problem in this state is the opioid crisis. Through Medicaid expansion, citizens in New Hampshire are getting drug treatment for the first time. More importantly, those incarcerated in our prison and county jails are now getting drug treatment through Medicaid expansion. We're keeping people alive through this program. We know with our Medicaid expansion, the poor are gonna to continue to go to emergency rooms, use it as their primary care physician, and the ratepayers and the taxpayers are gonna pay for it. It's a good program, it needs to be fixed. We want to need to work on it. Thank you, and uh, Representative Smith. 
Thank you. Wow, only one minute, huh? Okay, so for, <laughs> for, right? so first of all, the Medicaid expansion is not the only thing driving costs up. My former employer, at those painful open enrollment meetings when we used to have pretty good cheap insurance, would tell us every year that the Affordable Care Act, worst bill name ever, was what was causing them to have to raise the premiums and reduce the coverage. So there's that. You can't just say there's one factor. If we pull insurance coverage from the folks that have gotten it under Medicaid expansion, the minority party will beat us like a pinata until next November. So we have to be more creative than just repeal. We have to repeal and figure out something else. I'd like to see subsidizing private insurance for those people so that they go out and shop. Right now there is no free market. Let's create one. Let's let them start going to the insurance companies and complain about the coverage. Maybe then they can reduce the cost, get more options. There were, I heard on the radio this morning, six or 7,000 people receiving drug treatment uh, through the expanded Medicaid program. You have to find a way to cover that because that has become one of the biggest issues facing our state. So let it go, but fix it. Thanks. Hold right onto that microphone, Representative. Sure. Um, our next question comes from uh, Andy Cruz. With a mid year speaker election, I think it is fair to say that all of you want to pass on the message that New Hampshire is and will remain open and friendly to businesses. I've heard talk of plans to change certain laws and policies to make New Hampshire an even more business friendly environment, which is great. What I would like to ask about is a pledge to not only focus on making New Hampshire a more business friendly environment, but also a pledge or a commitment to do no harm to the current business environment. In other words, not just expanding the business highway, but also ensure the current lanes are kept free of legislatively created potholes. Are you willing to make such a commitment to keep the New Hampshire business community environment stable, i.e. such as the business note that was discussed in, in years prior? Thank you for the question. The Representative Smith, you are first. Yeah, thanks. No, uh, sta stable's always good because the businesses that are coming here want to be able to know what's going to affect their investment long term. Um, and if you have a legislative history of ping-ponging on issues that are going to affect them, they're going to go someplace else. Uh, having said that, one of the biggest things that we can do is try to figure out what to do about the electric rates. I think that's the biggest barrier right now, and we should be all hands on deck focusing on that. Nothing else that we do is going to have a bigger impact. Uh, where I live, we have Whalen, and they have other places in the country that could go do business, and they're considering it because of our electric rates. You have Eversource saying that if we don't do Northern Pass, rates will go even higher. There's no plan to reduce the, uh, the rates right now. They actually said in a meeting I was in, oh, you think things are bad now. They'll be even worse if we don't do this. We have a, a, uh, experimental electricity generation plants. We should be trying to convert state facilities to use less electricity because that creates a market. These are the things we should focus on and, yeah, do no harm, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Representative Shirtwell. Thank you. Uh, as to your question, would I take a pledge? No, I wouldn't. I consider myself pro-business, but the only pledge I'd ever make is to the people of Ward 1, the village of Pentecook, that elect me to the House. That's the ones I pledge to every two years and in between on the City Council. Uh, We've got to work for business. We've got to keep business in the state. Uh, Steve mentioned well, and we know they're facing problems with electrical costs over there. They're talking about going back to Connecticut. We've got to bring new jobs into New Hampshire. We've got to keep the jobs we presently have in the Grand State. We've got to work on reducing the cost of post-public uh, secondary education. 51% of our students are leaving New Hampshire, go to college, out of state, and then they aren't coming back. They're staying out and it's hurting us. Um, I would work to make New Hampshire a better environment for business and for growth and to bring new people into the state. That would be a promise, not a pledge. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Sanborn. Yes, I absolutely do pledge to do no harm to the current business community. Um, as founder and chair of the nonpartisan House Business Caucus, we spent a lot of effort to review every single bill to make sure it made no harm on our current employers, but also to be friendly to future employers as well. Um, I, I do think that regulations are very costly, and that's an area that we don't have to upset the apple cart too much, but we can make it a lot easier and a lot more affordable to run an, a business in the state. And we'll be working on doing those things this year. 
Thank you. Uh, Representative McConnell. Thank you. I am anxious to see businesses prosper in New Hampshire, and I'm anxious to see more businesses come to New Hampshire. Having said that, uh, I have an LSR in this year that will ensure that in the event that someone comes to New Hampshire, seeing it as the easiest environmental regulations in New England, that if in fact they do pollute the atmosphere and the water and the soil, as St. Gobain has, um, that in fact they be responsible not only for the complete remediation of all of that damage, but an additional 50% charge to go into the general fund. The bottom line is that I'm very anxious to see businesses come to New Hampshire, but if they want to come to New Hampshire because they are a polluter and are going to make not only life for our citizens, but also permanently spoil aquifers and everything else, quite frankly, I can do without them. Bottom line is I'm anxious to see businesses come to New Hampshire, but they have to understand that when they come here, they can't make a mess of the place and not clean it up. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Chandler. Yes, I not only would pledge uh, to do no harm, I would pledge to continue working to try and reduce our business taxes so businesses can better afford to not only come here, but stay here. And Representative Balasano. First of all, as a signer with the Americans for Prosperity uh, um, thing they had, and then along with your Ed Neal, your, uh, I haven't uh, voted on one tax in 11 years. Not one tax I haven't voted on, because as a young kid, I used to ask Tip O'Neill, why do you continue to tax the people, the working people? Those are the people that have to pay the taxes, not the, if you've got deep pockets. So I'd sign that pledge in a heartbeat. Thank you. Next question uh, goes to uh, Michelle Lavelle. There is a retained bill from the 2017 session, Senate Bill 193, that would create education savings accounts, ESAs, for low-income children. It would operate much like health savings accounts with limited eligibility requirements, approved uses, accountability mechanisms, as well as third-party auditing and oversight. What would you do as speaker to support this small but critical educational opportunity bill? Thanks for the question. Uh, first up this round will be uh, Representative Sanborn. I think it's a great bill. The committee's done some great work and I look forward to seeing its passage. Uh, we need to give parents more choices and more control of their child's education so they can find the absolute best match for their child. I think is a great way to go. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity and I think as speaker, we will rally the troops to get all Republicans on board, and I certainly hope we can get Democrats on board, too. Representative Chandler. Yes, I support that issue and would do what I could to help in both the committee and on the floor. Representative Shirley. Thank you very much for the question. After I retired from the federal government, I spent four years as a substitute teacher in Merrimack Valley. Uh, I know how good our public school system is. I'm a graduate of Bishop Brady, a private school. My understanding of this bill, this bill would take $32 million away from public education. That concerns me. And as, from what I've read, I would probably vote against it, to be honest with you. Representative Balsam. As a father of seven children, about $130,000 in debt and education loans, I would support this in a heartbeat. Okay, because I understand what it is to educate my children. I understand what it is to sit around the table and try to figure out what do you pay this way, okay, you know, to make sure your children are educated. So I would support this bill in a heartbeat. And as a speaker, you're damn right I'll make damn, that damn well that passes. Uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I support the idea. And, when we have the arguments about taking money away from public schools, when it's because the kids' parents choose to send them elsewhere, I don't think that's a financial argument. The parents have the right to do that. What was also interesting to me is the arguments about public money going to private schools. I mean, have you ever thought about this? That means that they're considering it public money while it's, it's still in your pocket because they haven't actually collected it yet. You, you want to save it so that you can spend it on the school. As speaker, I try to keep us from getting into these deep in the weeds, convoluted things about 
money from here, money there, and generic arguments about education. A lot of times I'll see a title on a bill and we just hit the play button on pre-recorded arguments. You make them debate what's actually in there. I think that we can all learn something and probably pass it. And Representative McConnell. Thank you. I support the bill, but I do have a concern about it that I want to improve at some point. And that is that I want to make sure that parents of special needs children are taken care of. And they can't be taken care of at the same rate as everyone else. The fact is that their cost is the cost of those special needs students is far higher in the public schools or anywhere else. And the money that we could move to those parents to give them options as well should not be seen as a problem. As far as I'm concerned, anything that moves this decision to the parents' control or to increase the parents' control in this decision is a good idea. As far as I'm concerned, those funds, in fact, should go to the parents. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Next question, and I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I know it's Ed. Nail, like hammer, nail. Nail, that's easy. Ed Nail, go ahead. Yeah, New Hampshire House Speaker recently asked our Secretary of State to investigate the 2016 election. And the subsequent investigation found a substantial amount of November 8th, 2016, same-day voters, about 6,450, 540, uh, used an out-of-state driver's license to cast a vote, but the Department of Safety records show that 5,526 of those voters had not obtained a New Hampshire driver's license as of uh, August of 2017. And uh, you may or may not know that CNHT, in, in conjunction with Project Veritas, <coughs> bought some uh, voters in the primary using fake addresses in Manchester to vote. So since the 2016 Hampshire primary election held on February 9th, 2016, saw over 78,000 voters register between December 28th, uh, 2015 and the primary, would you support a similar check by the Department of Safety to see how many of these new voters who used an out-of-state driver's license as identification uh, to register to vote in New Hampshire have obtained a New Hampshire driver's license? Thank you for the question. First up this round will be uh, Representative Chen. Uh, yes, I would support that. And I support efforts that have gone on in the last session, well, actually a lot of sessions, to tighten up our election laws. It's just, I, I think our, our goal should be New Hampshire people should vote in New Hampshire, and that's that's really the, my position on the whole thing. And I, I think we've taken some good steps, there's more we can do, but to answer your question specifically, yes, I would ask for that information. Representative McConnell. Yes, I certainly support it, and I think we, I think one of the most important things that we can do here as a legislature is ensure the integrity of our elections. Representative Smith? Yeah, I support that, and not, not even because of the election aspect, but we have a statute on the books that when you move to New Hampshire, you're required to get a driver's license in 60 days. So why let people get away with it? If we're not in favor of that, we should repeal that law, but I haven't heard anyone suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Sanborn. I would support that, and I know that the vast majority of people in New Hampshire really want to make sure that New Hampshire people are voting in New Hampshire elections. We want a long-term vested interest in the state, and we are one of four states, I believe, that allows people to just zoom in on the day of the election and vote that same day, register and vote that same day. I think it's 46 other states, they close off that window 30 days before the election. Um, so we, need, we do need to tighten this up. We want to make sure that New Hampshire residents are voting in New Hampshire elections. Representative Shirley. Thank you. Uh, I'm reluctant to disagree with the Chair of Transportation, but I do believe that New Hampshire law says that you must get a New Hampshire license if you are gainfully employed in New Hampshire or you have children in public schools. I've got folks my age that would spend their winters in Florida and, still, and get Florida driver's license but still consider New Hampshire their home or residence. We have college students that aren't working, don't have children in school, but are attending college in New Hampshire that have out-of-state licenses. I spent three years in Ohio with the U.S. Marshal Service. The whole time I was there, I used my New Hampshire license because it was legal in Ohio. Um, I, don't, I think it's much really ado about nothing. And if, if people are violating, then they should be prosecuted, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. <laughs> And represent, uh, Representative Balthasar. I have to disagree with my friend Steve there, who's a veteran. <laughs> Veterans in the state of New Hampshire are required to vote absentee ballots. They have voting by officers in every one of their units, and they do the absentee. But yet, they allow anyone else without an ID, half a David's, and all that stuff to vote. 
This has to be fixed. Ed, you and I know we work hand in hand, and I've submitted your name up to Donald Trump's campaign, to which your phone number for them to contact you. I just did a special that's going to be coming out on the opposition. I showed him pictures. One of the senior citizens in my town took pictures, license plates, that parked across the street, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, license plates at my polls. Not count the 20 or 30, I counted that went into the polls. What are we trying to hide? That's all I have. Thank you, Representative Balsaro. Next question goes to Andrew Klein. Thank you, this one's on energy. Uh, data released last week by the U.S. Energy Information Administration shows again that New Hampshire is among the highest handful of states in the country with electricity rates. Maine and Vermont both have lower rates than New Hampshire. What should New Hampshire do to bring those rates down? Thank you for the question. First up this round will be Representative Shirley. Thank you for the question. I think we need to look for alternative uh, for sources of energy. As someone once said, the cheapest form is energy. Is that energy we don't use. Uh, I think we should look more to wind farms, solar, and other methods of bringing costs down. I like the idea put forward by a national grid to uh, use the energy produced in Quebec province and bring it down through Vermont. I am opposed to Northern Pass. I think it is too intrusive in the North Country, and especially going through here in the city of Concord. But we need to look for alternative forms of energy and look for other means of transporting electricity into the Granite State to reduce our costs. Representative Sanborn. We do need to bring those rates down, and we need to start working on this right away. <laughs> Overall, my personal belief is that we need to reduce or eliminate the mandates, including RPS, and all the subsidies that we're giving out, because those are raising rates for everyone else. Uh, but as speaker, I will work very closely with the committee members who are experts in this area, who have done the deep dive, who are doing the work, to have them look for some solutions specifically, and I look forward to working with them. Representative Balthasar. First of all, I would want to put a freeze uh, to the legislation and to the PUC, because every time we turn around, they're authorizing the uh, cost to go up and giving, let them charge more. My district in Londonderry is probably the fastest growing district in the state of New Hampshire. And the reason why we are, we've had a town manager to drop our taxes, okay? In the last um, two cycles, the tax has been dropped and they're going down again here on our next tax cycle. That makes a difference. I think if it was up to me, I would say open up the coal burner back up on electric on electricity. I would say, you know, get and push solar more. I put solar on my house. I save 250, 300 a month, okay? Because I have to think of my family putting food on the table. Why I did that. So there are so many ideas out there that we could be doing, but Legislation that scrubber that cost twenty million dollars that was pushed down to the the, the people that are paying the bills, just like Reggie, you know, that pennies, nickels, and dimes add up to dollars. Thank you, Representative uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. It, I, I feel like we keep looking for like the one big silver bullet, but that's not going to work. We have to start chipping away at this. And in my county, we bought a biomass plant for our county complex. It was run by an old oil fire. Uh, boiler that should be in the Smithsonian and the bond payments actually were less than the fuel payments plus the electricity costs because a happy accident with one of those plants is it spins a turbine and produces electricity. We have to uh, try to incentivize people to start looking at those things. And you see the Hazel Drive complex, the state complex, there's like acres on those roofs. Why aren't we trying to investigate if we bonded the cost of solar panels for that, will we reduce the energy demand? And when you can reduce the cost, that's going to help. Another problem that's hurting us right now are the storms because you can't budget those. They just happen. A lot of people have said, why aren't we just burying all the power lines? Once you do that, they're underground. And what's the answer? Well, they're too expensive. Well, that's, that's garbage, because you know what that cost is. Yeah, it's expensive, but what did this last storm cost? How much are we going to spend this winter? Here's the problem we don't know. we got to answer that question. Representative McConnell. Thank you. First thing we can do is ensure that we're not setting up the electric ratepayers in this state as mullets for private corporations that would be happy to shift any losses from their rate from their uh, stockholders to the electric ratepayers. Last year, I fought very hard to defeat, well, the year before last, I fought very hard to defeat a pipeline 
that Kinder Morgan proposed going across the southern part of the state, which was a private company's speculative export pipeline. Now, when Kinder Morgan ran into financial trouble and the, and the overseas market fell apart, that project was ended. Happily, it didn't happen six months after it did, because then we'd have been stuck with 20 years of stranded costs and capacity contracts that they wanted to fund the construction of that project with. We recently had another bill, Senate Bill 128, which I fought tooth and nail. The bottom line is anything that goes back to the PUC where they are able to listen to a corporation make its pitch that it's too risky for their stockholders, but the fact is that the electric ratepayers will benefit enormously, that doesn't seem to happen. The uh, PUC tries hard, but the fact is this is a very imperfect business. Thank you. And Representative Channel. Yes, thank you. I think, uh, as a matter of fact, just recently, I just read in the paper that the Science and Technology Committee took a small step forward to this issue, I think, and hopefully the House uh, will, will support their efforts when the time comes in January. And uh, so I, I applaud them for that. They're the real experts on this whole thing, as Representative Sanborn said. At the risk, I'm not in favor of committees very often or studies, but this may be time to get especially some of the experts that we have on the science committee together and come up with some sort of a plan that we should be following and some goals that we should be achieving here. So, but I applaud them for their efforts so far. Thank you, uh, Andy Cruz, you're up at the next question. Uh, this question is on workforce. One of the greatest concerns facing the business community um, is workforce. With an aging population, lack of highly skilled trades, and substance use issues, what steps as speaker, can you take to support the businesses in addressing these concerns? And a second question is the governor has been um, pushing a recovery-friendly workplace and is looking to push legislation or put legislation in that will allow a workplace um, tax credits and some su support in order to put people that are in the opioid epidemic that have proven to be in long-term recovery and try to get them back to work. And is, is that something you could support? Thanks for the question. Representative Smith, you're up first. Sure, I can support that. I mean, anything we can do to help somebody get back to work. Uh, a little known bill that we had in 2011 allowed people that were developmentally disabled to try out at a job to see if maybe they're not disabled. I mean, you hang a label on somebody, it's hard to get rid of, and sometimes they believe it. But the hook there was that the employers were uh, concerned that they'd be on the hook for uh, not a workers' comp. And there were other people that were concerned that they would take advantage of them. We worked that out and got it passed. So yeah, support anything that helps somebody that doesn't think they can necessarily get to work tomorrow to do it. That's, that's good for everybody. Representative Balsar. Andy, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm a former headhunter. When I retired from the Marine Corps, I was a headhunter, then I was the vice president of sales, market recruiting for staffing. I used to have to think out of the box. I went into Texas, Florida, um, and others in Detroit with a program called Smart Solutions. I used to set up a table in certain areas and then drive people in for some of our contracts like uh, the USA Today, um, the Plano newspaper and other stuff were our clients. Well, for the work program here in New Hampshire is killing us. Medicaid expansion also, you could be making as a family over 70,000 a year and get Medicaid expansion, live in a million dollar home and not have a lien on your house. What we need to do is look at the actual data on Medicaid expansion. Why would you want to go to work if you're making 30, 35, 40,000? Thank you, Representative. Oh, sorry, time's up. Sorry. Um, are you looking for I'm looking, yeah. Where's Carol? Where's Carol? Oh. You can go ahead, I won't take it. Let's <laughs> get right here. Okay, you'll do it. Explain. Good. All right. Representative Sherville. Oh. Uh, the question, you mentioned workforce and immediately think of workforce housing, which is something I know the BIA supports and I support, and I've done so here in Concord. The problem is our housing costs have gone up dramatically in the Grand State, and we need to provide housing for young professionals to come in to New Hampshire. Our, our nurses, our firefighters, our police, and other our teachers, that they can stay and afford to live in New Hampshire and work in New Hampshire. Um, that is something I would push for as speaker. 
to do more for workforce housing, not low income housing, but workforce to help our young professionals. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, Representative McConnell. The, uh, I'd certainly be supportive of anything that uh, will help ensure that we have a quality workforce. The biggest problem we have, however, is the fact, for example, in Cheshire County, where I'm from, we have two million square feet of empty industrial space. It isn't just a function of the fact they can't find employees, they don't want to move here. And the fact is that until we get businesses here, they're going to be able to retain workers and hire some, even from out of state, if they pay well enough, uh, we're going to have a problem. The fact is we've become uneconomic and this situation is only going to get worse. Uh, I'm not persuaded that we don't have people in the state who'd be happy to take some jobs, but the fact is a really good paying job is something that will attract somebody from somewhere else, but we have to attract that company in the first place. Right now, we are competing with company with businesses, or with rather states, that uh, have 0% uh, business profits tax and no business enterprise tax. That's pretty tough. That has to change. We've got a bifurcated economy where we have four counties doing extremely well, and six that are circling the drain. It isn't just the fact we don't have the employees. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Chandler. Yes, thank you. I support workforce housing with a caveat that I'm very concerned that the state is passing regulations which overrule local zoning, and I think that's, I think that's wrong. If the local community wants to uh, put in a program or whatever they decide to do to, to allow for workforce housing in that community, I think that's fine, but it should be left to the local community. So as the governor's initiative, I'm, so, I'm not aware of it. I did learn a little something from my grandfather a long time ago. I shouldn't comment on something that I'm not familiar with. So I'd have to take a look at that. I will say, generally speaking, what we need, we need more beds. Our goal needs to be to provide more beds for the treatment of these folks. And that, that's, whether that's how we do that, I don't have an answer, but that should be our goal, is the more beds. And Representative uh, Semler. We do have a workforce issue, uh, and we are going to have to work on it to attract more people into the workforce. Um, but I think part of that is right now we might be over-encouraging all students out of high school to go to a four-year degree, and we need to also encourage to people to look at other skilled types of jobs that don't require a degree and learning the trades. So I think we need a little bit more diversity there. I think as an employer myself, I need lots of different types of skill sets. Um, I'd like to also see us expand internship opportunities and learning opportunities for more people of all ages. If you're someone who's in their 50s, you've finished your corporate career, and now you'd like to try something new, it's hard to try something new because you don't have experience yet. But you might be willing to spend a month or two at an employer learning a new skill, and they might be willing to do that for you. So I'd like to see us explore those avenues. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Lavelle has the next question increasingly we hear instances of bullying at schools which officials are unable to deter in the last couple weeks videos of fights at salem high school hit the internet and a high prof profile racial and political based case involved a state rep's grandson last fall as speaker what would you do to empower bullied children to escape these intolerable circumstances so they can be in a safe educational environment. Thank you, Michelle, for the question. Representative McConnell, your question. I'd do everything I could to empower their parents to take them out of that school and to take the money that is allotted to those children for their education with them. Thank you. Representative Balasaro. First of all, school choice is a beautiful thing. Uh, the bullying is a local control issue. As a legislator, I mean, as a father, I know what I would do would be totally different in the law. I don't think we need that. And I don't think we need, I've confronted this with seven children in different areas. I just went looking for the father, you know, to bully him. But anyways, um, you know, it's, it's something that with parents have to get involved. But we were in the right, the legislator did the right thing before when we came forward with those tax credits to help children, low-income children are struggling and being bullied or whatever in those schools. One size doesn't fit all to get them into another program. And it's been working out. But I think the local control need to get moms and dads. And when you send the whole kid home and you put them on uh, retention at home, it does no good. If you keep them in, put them in a classroom by himself, that's where you put them instead of sending them home to what eventually it'll change. Representative Chairman. Yes, thank you. Right. 
strong plea. Uh, support <coughs> anything that will help them, uh, get this bullying issue under control. It's something that should not be tolerated. I'm just not sure exactly what the state should do, because it is a local control issue to a point. I'd be certainly willing to look to see from the education experts of the local communities and the state board if there's legislation needed to give the local authorities more power to control this type of thing, then I would be in favor of doing that. Anything we could do to help, certainly. Representative Smith. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, as a speaker doesn't get a magic wand. Um, by yourself, you can't do anything. What, one of the problems now is we kind of have a, a whipped up culture where, where conflicts are normal. Uh, I mean, just re watch the TV. People enjoy being mad at each other. It's like living in an episode of the uh, World Wrestling Federation sometimes. As speaker, one of the most useful things I could do is, while I don't get a magic wand, I do get a, excuse the expression, bully pulpit. And I would use it to tell people that that behavior is not okay. You should respect everybody. I'm not better or smarter or more powerful than anybody here. And the person that I have a conflict today with, I, I may need them to be my ally tomorrow. I would just use every opportunity I had to go to schools and talk to people that it's time to realize that your opponent today might be the friend you need tomorrow and that we, we need to be more respectful as a society. Representative Sample. So, of course, as Speaker, what we're talking about is legislation, and uh, it is tough to, at, at the state level, tell individual schools what to do, but this is why school choice is so very important, because if you find your child in a situation that is not helping them learn, you need the right and the option to be able to pull them out and put them in a place that works best for their education. And Representative Schrickler. Thank you. Uh, I would reach out to the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police and ask what we could do, working with school resource offices to make that school a more safe environment and a more inviting environment for all students. We talk about bullying, but we know in Manchester even more uh, worse offenses have occurred in public schools. Uh, we've got to put a stop to it. Uh, our schools have always been a safe place for our children to go to and should remain that way. I'd also work with juvenile probation offices to see what can be done. If we need legislation at the juvenile level to make their jobs easier, then that's what we would look to uh, uh, pass. But we've got to make schools a safe environment for all our students. Thank you. Ed Neal, next question. Uh, yeah. On November 8th, during our last general election, uh, we became aware of a gentleman who flew to New Hampshire from Florida after voting there early and in Atlanta, Georgia early, walked into the Hookset polling station and registered to vote and voted using the address of a local family where he did not live. Uh, he was later arrested for something else, but uh, would, would, you suggest, would you support making our taxpayers supported statewide voter database a public document for all New Hampshire voters to access so that family would know that someone was using their house to vote it would be more of a self-policing uh, system if we had voter database we could access. I get Vermont's once a month updated voter checklist mailed to my email to my home. Would you support uh, making it a public document? Representative Balthasar. Well, that's a great question. That would in a heartbeat. And I can tell you, there's a Democrat person in my town who has about 20 people registered at her house. I personally know. I personally know she has two daughters, but yet there's 20 people during election registered at that house. There's a few others in my district with the same thing. We need to do whatever we can do to stop this fly-by voting. And that's what's going on, okay? But when you talk to some of my friends on the left that are in my district, oh no, that's no problem. Gee, gee, 20 people can live there. Well, you only got three bedrooms on the, you live in there, they, all in 10, I mean, in the yard, you know what I'm saying? This is crazy. So I would support any legislation to hold people accountable because they don't realize you're stepping on somebody else's vote. It has to be fixed. Representative McConnell? I probably would I'd have to look at it. I, I have some concerns about it from a privacy standpoint, but by the same token, if you can't determine whether or not those 15 people living next door are in fact legitimate voters, that makes a difference. So I'd be inclined to think that I would. Representative Chairman. 
Yes, I would support that. <laughs> Representative Sandler. Yeah, I do have a similar personal privacy concern, so I, I would want to see exactly how we do this. Um, but election integrity is so important that I'm open to it because we do need to make sure that we don't have uh, fraud in this area. Representative Shirtman. Thank you for the question. I guess today I'm, on, I'm to the right of uh, Representative Bob Lasaro, but I totally agree with him that anybody who vote, violates our voting laws should be prosecuted. And uh, we have this anecdotal information, and I think if people know that the laws are being violated, they should go to their local prosecutors and have them charged with the offense. To the question is release, releasing that information, we saw the problem when the President's Commission came to New Hampshire, New, Vo New Hampshire voter files were first released. We've got individuals, not just women, but some men who are, have domestic violence orders out against um, paramours and former uh, associates. Those names are in the voter files. We don't want to release those to the public. They've got to be protected. I think at times we release too much information on pr uh, privacy issues, and some things need to be protected. And rep it, uh, Representative Smith. Yeah, wow, I didn't make it through a forum without violating the pledge you asked earlier. Do no harm to business. There are a lot of people making a lot of money selling our voting records, and if we made it public, that would have to stop. So I apologize, but yeah, I would support that. Scrub to the personal stuff that was referenced earlier, and I think that's what happened with the commission. And I imagine that would eliminate the market for it, but so be it. Thank you, Representative. Just for the members of the audience, um, just so you know, we have got through about two-thirds of our uh, questions right now. Each uh, panelist will have one more one more question. Andrew Klein. You're going to realize that we each have three more. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a little bit out of the blue question, but I think it's going to be an important issue coming up next session, and um, it's been an important issue in the past. There are 221 occupations in New Hampshire that require a license for you to become employed in that occupation. That's 15% of occupations in New Hampshire. By contrast, union occupations, I think, are only about 4%, and minimum wage jobs make up only about 2% of all occupations. So it's a, it's a huge percentage. Those occupations that require a license from the state include geologists, hearing aid dealer, landscape architect, manicurist, athlete agent, and auctioneer, among many others. Do you support broad reforms to reduce the barrier to entry for citizens seeking employment in New Hampshire? And if so, what would you like to see? Representative Smith, you're up first. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the, the categories don't make sense. So, so two of the ones that you mentioned, a landscape architect, no. I mean, that's between you and the architect. They carry out insurance to cover any damage they do. That should be fine. An auctioneer, I could see an argument for because then there's a fiduciary responsibility and you know, a possible fraud. So yeah, broad reform. And I think the way you start is by going through that list and just separate out the ones that do have some fiduciary responsibility. Um, a real estate agent where a broker has to be responsible and there's serious consequences if you do break the law. Uh, professions where, while you're not a lawyer, People expect you to be able to give a legally correct opinion on something. Uh, yeah, that you should be able to get rid of a lot of them. Representative Shipman. Thank you for your question. Um, my dad was a licensed plumber. He worked out of his profession. It was a very important job. And uh, I know a lot of the licenses we, we hear about people having, and we just kind of scoff and say, why is that important? We had legislation a couple of years ago to take away license requirement for beauticians. And then I'm looking at the people that mix chemicals where I get my hair cut, and I realize how important that position is. I'd want to find out from those professions, like landscape architects, why they feel it's necessary, how it protects uh, people to use their services before I flatly say this eliminated. Representative Sample. I do think we need to overhaul that system and really take a look at the whole thing. And I believe there's a bill in LSR that's in process right now by Representative Silver. Uh, we do need to look at that because we need to remove barriers if there is no need for them. And if we can go to a lower level of requirement so that someone could get into that profession, I'd like to see us do that. Maybe it's not a license, maybe it's a certification. Or maybe it's not even a certification that's necessary. But we talk about broadening the workforce. 
Um, adding more licenses is not broadening the workforce, it's actually making it harder to get into the workforce. Representative McConnell? Yes, to a certain extent, this is a uh, New Hampshire version of regulatory capture where an industry determines that they want to make it harder for others to get in. So I would be receptive to looking at it. I think obviously some of them continue, would need to continue to be regulated, but by the same, need to continue to be licensed. Uh, but by the same token, I think there are probably a good many that could come off that list. Thank you. Representative Chandler. Yes, thank you. Uh, I certainly think the list, so to speak, that we're referring to should be taken a look at. And I think the only things that shouldn't be looked at necessarily, although there are some areas that even these should be, are fiduciary responsibilities, as Representative Smith mentioned, and life and safety issues. I think those need to have some sort of licensure. But I still even think they need to be looked at to see the depth of what they're doing and make sure they're actually providing a service instead of just propagating the industry. And Representative uh, Baldessaro. 221 occupations, I think it's a, a lot of it is a revenue grab. Okay, um, I sponsored legislation a few years ago which came into law under licensing and credentialing yeah, to fix the issues of our veterans coming home that are school trained electrician, plumbers, carpenters, um, even their spouses that have, uh, you know, that are nurses and other stuff. To waive the testing in New Hampshire, you figure in, in the Navy corpsman is an EMT wants to work at EMT, he's got the training to be a physical, you know, physician assistant, but yet he's got to t retake the test and go to school again. So I fixed that law, and then we were the only, what everyone don't know, we're the only state in the country that put that law in place. Now other states have fallen through, and I actually went to the White House with Mich Michelle Obama and briefed on what New Hampshire did to help other states there on licensing credentialing. So we need to take a look. Thank you, Repres Representatives uh, Andy Cruz, you know. So this will touch on a little bit of the past business of the House, House Bill 517, um, the trailer bill. First, as a business owner, I'm extremely thankful for the uh, tax relief um, that you have allowed the business community. Um, a concern going forward, as a business owner, I still am concerned about being able to plan accordingly. Uh, coming up on future budget cycles, as Speaker, will you be committed to the business tax relief that has been committed over the next three years um, in 2019 and 2021. Thanks for the question, Representative Samuel. Absolutely. Representative Chandler. Yes. <laughs> Representative Shirley. No, but let me tell you why. <laughs> I voted against the budget. One of the reasons was the business tax cut that was in the budget. We were told that that tax cut was put in there to help stimulate the business environment in New Hampshire. This is a state with one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Whenever you cut money from a budget, whether it's a family budget or a city budget or a state budget, that means some program is not being funded and there's gotta be an offset. And being a member of the Concord City Council now for 10 years, we have seen time and time again, both by Democrats and Republicans, downshifting to our local communities whenever we cut taxes at the state level. Those expenses have been put on the backs of local property taxpayers. So if you could tell me what we're gonna cut in state government to support and pay for that business tax cut, I might look at it, but otherwise I can't just say yes to it. Representative Baldessaro. <laughs> of course she is, but I, you know, we need, one of the words we've forgotten in this state is the New Hampshire advantage. Do you remember those words? You remember they already used to say uh, less spending equals less taxes? The business are the ones that put people to work. I think every legislator should do everything we can to continue to support businesses so we put people to work. You know, they put people to work, not government. Thank you. Representative Smith. Yes, I, I kind of disagree with the concept that tax cuts need to be paid for you to spend less. I've had my income go down and I didn't go, well, somebody else could give me more money. I, I made adjustments, that happens. But I mean, the real answer too is when you just pass a policy and you're not gonna go the next year and say, awesome, that works. It takes a longer time to evaluate that. One, two years, I mean, three might be statistically significant enough to make a decision, but of course I support it. We've done it, and you have to see how it plays out before you can make an informed decision. 
and represent the client. Yes, absolutely, we are uncompetitive. The fact is that we have to get back to the point where we were. We started at 25 years ago when Stephen Moore wrote an article in, I believe it was Business Week, where he said New Hampshire has no business being in New England because its economic performance is such that when New England goes into recession, New Hampshire doesn't notice. And when New England comes out of recession, New Hampshire leads the way. It should really be part of Texas, this is what he said. The fact is, that was before we had a business enterprise tax and a business profits tax. Right now, as I say, we are uncompetitive. We can't get there if we continue to let our general fund spending, which is what we had control over last year, increase almost 10%, particularly when other states around the nation are looking at a 0%. Um, I argued that point, couldn't make the sale, but the fact of the matter is that profligate spending leads to higher taxes. We've got to get a grip on it. There are plenty of places where we're just going to have to cut. Uh, I've supported plenty of expenditures. The fact is, if they don't work out, I won't be supporting them in the future. Excuse me. Can I use the balance of my time on that question, since I didn't use much? No, you can't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Michelle Abel, you have the next question. New Hampshire's education tax credit program provides private scholarships for low and middle income families to choose the education option that best fits their child's needs. This school year, they awarded 260 scholarships. How would you as speaker help grow this important program? Thank you for the question, Representative Chandler. I would continue to support that program and the expansion of it. I think that it's worked very well. Uh, it was a lot of doomsday talk when it first started, certainly, but I think the business community stepped up to the plate to support it, and I think it's been good for the ed education of the kids. And uh, to con use the rest of my time on the last question, <laughs> uh, I think, yes, those we need to reinforce those tax cuts. Businesses need to count on that in the years to come. If we need to make other budget adjustments, that's so be it. I don't think we will, but if we do, we can't let the businesses just say, okay, we're this only for a year type thing. So I support the continuation. Representative McConnell on Ms. LaBelle's question. Yes, I certainly support the program. As a matter of fact, I think it's way too small and I'd do everything I could to expand it. Representative Smith. Yeah, back to the bully pulpit thing, one of the things that I would do is talk to some of the recipients of that that have success stories, and there's cameras, and they do like to talk to us sometimes, and we are salesmen, trumpet that success. You don't get a magic wand, but you do get access to outlets and maybe a louder voice in the state, and if you go out with regular human interest stories, don't make it a political argument, say, look, this family's better off and this child is better off because of this program, it makes it a whole lot easier to support and expand. That's how I would start. Representative Sandler. I think it's a wonderful program. I'm a big supporter. And it, toward, you know, I know this year we had a bill to make some technical corrections to make it stronger program. So I guess we need to listen to the business community more, uh, maybe accountants, the Ways and Means Committee, the Education Committee, to make sure that uh, the program is working properly. And if there's some barrier or some sort of regulatory thing that's causing it not to grow, we'll have to remove those barriers. So I'm happy to work with you on that and work with the members of the committee. Representative Shirtley. Thank you. You may be shocked by my answer, but uh, maybe not. I'm opposed to the program, and I'll tell you why. I know that businesses are getting a deduction for uh, contributing to the program. If they want to voluntarily give money to a scholarship program, I'd applaud them for doing it. Uh, they have their reason for making donations to the program. I'd rather see that money come into the state or the State Department of Education the to go to scholarships to the State Department of Education as general funds revenue. We would eliminate, eliminate the 5% handling fee we're now paying to handle those funds and have it done by the Department of Education. And Representative Baldessaro. Wow, 260 kids, low-income children that got to break one size doesn't fit all in the public school, and yet we're against that. I think we should be tripling, quarter, you know, whatever we need to do. So I would support in a heartbeat to do whatever we have to do. And like I said, as a father of seven children, I have one kid they want to put on Ritalin. He's got a degree, he's doing a live PD show. You know, when he was younger, I refused. So he didn't fit in the public school, but he, we sacrificed and made it happen. And he got, he's doing great. So keep up the good work, thank you. And now, would you as speaker take every effort 
to uh, oppose the uh, adoption of an income or sales tax in the state of New Hampshire. Representative Shirley. Bless you. Um, <laughs> I live in the city of Concord. We are donating community to the state because we have so much state tax exempt property in the state. Um, I would look at the bill that came up, if it was a progressive tax or what, what the parameters are. I would never say one way or another without seeing the actual bill. Um, we know that the ghosts of Mel Thompson and Bill Loeb still roam the Granite Hills of New Hampshire and uh, an acts of tax that still resonates from uh, Mount Cube. So uh, uh, without seeing any legislation, I wouldn't make a, a decision one way or the other, but thank you. Representative Sanborn. Yes, I would absolutely oppose any sales or income tax. Um, we need to keep this a low cost state. I think it's actually fairly expensive to live here as it is, and so I would never add those taxes. And in fact, we've had a bill that we're looking at that I'd take a look at and maybe, because uh, we do have an income tax, it's an interest and dividends tax. So folks who are making some income that way, we do have a tax on that, and I think we should reduce or eliminate that as well. Representative Balsar. I would definitely know. I mean, 11 years of not going to one tax. Why would I start now? Bill O'Brien would be kicking in my door if I ever did that. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Smith. Yeah, and I'm glad Representative Sanborn brought up the income tax that we already have. I wouldn't support any new sales taxes. When Herman Cain was trying to convince me about his 999 plan, I said, I'm an Hampshire state rep and I'm a Republican. I'm never going to vote for a sales tax. So what about the ones you already have? Um, what is it, like 7% on fishing tackle, 10% on firearms and ammo? It, he gave me a quite impressive list, and if you didn't know about it, it's because we hide it from you by not putting it on the receipts. So, not only won't I vote for a new sales or income tax, I'd like to have legislation and to start being honest with the voters about the sales taxes they're already paying. Representative McConnell. Yes, I absolutely oppose a sales and income tax. The fact is that uh, the uh, the fact is that that's one of the real advantages that we have here in New Hampshire, and it's a large part of the reason a lot of us live here. If in fact we were, we were to impose an income tax, quite frankly, the only way I think we'd really make out is if we put in a toll on the outgoing bridges. In New Jersey, in New Jersey, when they went to a millionaire's tax, my brother had gone to school with a state treasurer, called him and said, I know 12 people who are leaving in the past week. And he said, well, they didn't vote for us, so we don't really care. That's not much of a philosophy. As far as I'm concerned, we ought to be making this a state that everybody wants to live in as it used to be. And the key to that is ensuring that our taxes are as low as they can possibly be. It's the only advantage we've got in New England. Thank you. And Representative Chen. It's not only would I oppose one, I would very, very strongly oppose any of either one of those income or sales taxes. Thank you. Uh, as part of the program, uh, this went quite a bit quicker than I anticipated. Uh, I gave the panelists the opportunity to develop what we call the lightning round question, which was a simple yes or no. I'm gonna give each panelist the opportunity to give one question. It's gotta be framed in, in a response that will get them either yes or no or a one word answer. So, we will start with Mr. Klein. I told you we had asked a question. <laughs> Would you support state funding for commuter rail? We'll start on this end and just go right down the road. No. Yes. No. 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 <laughs> Andy Cruz. I'm actually going to change my question because I love that concept. Would you support legislation to be transparent on meals and rooms tax, all fees, throughout the state and actually be transparent with the individuals and pass legislation to support that. Yes. Start down uh, Al Zen. Yes. 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 Yeah, I believe in transparency. Yes. Michelle? Would you oppose efforts to increase homeschool reporting requirements to public school and state authorities? Jim, sorry yes. to go this one. Yes. No. Yes. 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 And Mr. Nail, would you support legislation to make public, uh, state documents, public documents posted online as some other states have done already? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Start it, Alvin. Yeah, uh, did you? Yes. Can we go in this way? Yeah. Yes. 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 yes, and in fact, I have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure where JR is, if he has anything else. Uh, I'd, I'd really like to thank the panelists for taking the time out of their day. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And we're going to wrap up, right? We are going to wrap up. And I'd also like to, uh, before I thank the, the candidates, I'd really like to thank you all for staying on topic, staying on time, and uh, actually addressing the audience and the panelists as, as I asked you to do. It made it go very quick and it was uh, very good. Thank you very much and for the candidates. And I guess that concludes. No, it doesn't. We're going to wrap up. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We had a one minute closing remarks. I'm sorry. I almost forgot that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll go back. Uh, Representative Burt was first, but it uh, looks like Mr. Mc uh, Representative McConnell. Okay, I've got one minute, so I'll take it. The uh, fact is that one of the other issues that I didn't have a chance to talk, to, uh, talk about in my first two minutes was the issue of transparency. I believe you can learn a great deal about someone by looking at the bills that he's sponsored. This year I have three transparency bills. The first would ensure that the House hearings in the Committees, committee hearings, work sessions, executive sessions, committees of conference would be live streamed and digitally recorded so that you could look at them later. That's an important transparency issue. The second would be that because of the fact that in the past the governor's executive orders have sometimes been hard to find, uh, going to require that the governor, within 72 hours of signing an executive order, post it on an executive order registry on his website. And the third, because of my experience with the budget last year, will require that we have a commitment and contingent liability statement that would be required for the following five years. And this is an effort to ensure that our budget is more transparent than it already is, and it isn't. Thank you, Representative McConnell. Uh, Representative Sherman. I want to thank the Freedom Caucus for inviting me to be here today, and I do appreciate that. And I want to thank everybody who's up on this uh, podium with me. I do consider them friends, and uh, I wish them all well, but I guess not too well. Um, you know, I, I, we heard a lot today about things we disagree on, and I want to remind people, as they do in my district, about 80% of the bills we pass in the legislature, either on a consent calendar, or they come from the floor without any debate, it's at 20% where we get disagreement. And a lot of times on legislation, we can work together to find common ground. That's something we need to do more of as we go into the future, and I think events like this today helps that become a reality, so thank you. Representative Samuel. Thank you all for being here and for tuning in and listening and taking this so seriously. I do believe it is time for change. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. It's time to put a new speaker in place who will work with the governor, who will get positive results, who will unify Republicans, who will rebuild our party, and who will ensure that Republicans remain in the majority in 2018. I am that speaker. And I look forward to working with absolutely everyone in the House to achieve those goals. And I will work with everyone with kindness and respect and professionalism. So I ask for your support on November 28th and on November 30th. Thank you, Representative. Rep uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. As I used to be chairman of the Sullivan County Republican Committee, I did recruiting for them in four years. And while I did, I doubled their representation in the House. And the other side doesn't hate me. That's really the key. Uh, we've got a great record as uh, the Transportation Committee. I've gotten a lot of bills out where we have our debate, and then afterwards we're still friendly and we have things go out unanimously or with bipartisan votes. The key is civil debate. Don't take it personally. and It's appropriate on veto day to say it is just business. It's not personal. We're all colleagues, and that's what I would bring, a workmanlike attitude that just gets stuff done. Representative Chen. Thank you. Thank you very much for the forum. Enjoyed it. And uh, I just wanted to say two things back on Medicaid, I get an interview, that I strongly support the work requirement that's in the budget presently, and I also would not even consider supporting any kind of Medicaid enhancement that had any, or expansion that had any state funds involved with it. So I just want to make that clear. 
The other thing that I have pledged and that I would not do, and I want to point that out here, that if there's any PAC that I'm involved with, the House Leadership PAC or whatever it may be, the elect House Republicans, will not be involved in primarying any Republican. If you're a Republican, you're not going to get any opposition from any PAC that I have anything to do with, and I want to make that clear. Thank you, Representative, and Representative uh, Baldessaro. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks, Lynn, uh, to the Freedom Caucus, Americans for Prosperity, and you all for stepping up. Uh, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you all. We're all tied to that line, right, as fellow Republicans? We want local control, we want everyone else to get involved. I think out of the box, I, I believe in scary experience counts. I want to thank the Democrats for being here, the Libertarians, and my fellow Republicans, because this is a great, the Speaker's job is about the House. It's about the whole house, making things happen, transparency. I want to put the government, the state house, their checkbook on the, um, on the site. I want people to be able to see how your tax pay is being paid. I want to make them well sure that we're putting out the right bill. I want to make sure that we understand what team means. Together, everyone achieves more. So I'm asking you for your support as your next speaker. Together, we'll make a difference. Okay, now we can, how about a round of applause for our candidates? Thank you all again for coming, and that uh, concludes the poll. Because the way the law is actually written, they shall find you. So I'm rolling that back and saying, no, if the parents say it's okay to work, it's okay. And then, right, exactly.